morning. So let's uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And it says this, Therefore put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long or crave for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. Again, I thank, I'm thankful for uh, that word of God which can penetrate sharper than any two-edged sword. And it doesn't matter where a person is, whether it's in jail or whether it's in your home, sitting in comfort. Lord, we know that that word can dig deep into a person's heart. So Father, again this morning, thank you for that living word today. As we just learn more about you, pray that the Holy Spirit will be the teacher, will show us the things that we need to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And so we've had a living hope, a living lifestyle. And then last week as we closed out chapter 1, it was a living love. And uh, taken from verse 22, love one another deeply from the heart. And it then defined that and talked about a sincere brotherly love. And if you remember, we looked at that concept of what that means. We talked about how love has to be sincere and it has to go deep. It has to be real. It has to be a love that we need to understand is not phony. It's not just something we say with words and then our actions prove otherwise. So that's the love that Peter's trying to get his church to understand that we as believers have to embrace a different kind of love that's out there. And so this week, we're going to see how, as we start this new chapter, that there's a word at the beginning that connects what we talked about last week to what we're now going to talk about this week. And it's that word, therefore. So in other words, love must be sincere, love must go deep, therefore, and then we continue with the subject, with the theme. Therefore, we must show it, we must prove it, and we must do that by the way we live and act for that to be effective. And so therefore, we now must take note of what Peter is going to say and what he's going to instruct us with. So a living love part two now continues what we talked about last week. If you didn't listen to the message or hear it, you can go online. Uh, Gemma sends out the link for that. It does connect very well. So listen to that as well as listening to this this week and connect them. As we look at verse one and two, I believe Peter gives two things that we have to pay, pay close attention to. So that if we say we love our brothers and sisters, you and I have to prove it by understanding this teaching. <coughs> what do I mean by that? Well, verse 1 describes a certain horizontal attitude and, and, and sins, if you like, against a brother or a sister that we need to put off. And then in verse 2, it describes a vertical reality of spiritual growth, and therefore a closer walk with God. So there's a horizontal directive, and then a vertical directive that you and I need to see in these verses before us. It's a living love, not just in word only, but by the way we live it out and get rid of those things that I know the devil uses to create havoc amongst us. And then when we get rid of those things, we can grow in faith by his word. So let's look at verse 1 and look at those horizontal attitudes that you and I need to identify and, and, and if we see them, we experience them in our lives or in the lives of other people, we can now know what they are and be rid of them. 
As we look at these attitudes, we notice there's five of them. Peter says we are to rid ourselves, put off, to put away with these things that he's about to talk about. It's interesting that the verb that is used in this instance is the one that you would use for maybe taking off dirty clothes. I don't know about you, but as a kid I used to get filthy. <laughs> filthy dirty. You know, we'd play from morning till night. And usually we'd find some mud to play in. And we'd go and we'd come in at night and we'd be mud from head to toe. My mum used to say, go upstairs and strip off. And you have to take all your clothes off. There was a hot bath running and get in the bath. And there was a pile of mud. And by the way, there were six of us. Can you imagine six piles of muddy clothes on the bathroom floor? And, and she would say, go, go and get all your dirty clothes off. And, and when I look at this verse or these verses here this morning, this is that connotation of, of stripping off something that's dirty. I did it when I was playing soccer, covered from, from head to foot in mud every time we played soccer. And then you'd go in the changing rooms and jump under the shower. And as we look at these verses here, it's giving us this understanding of, of taking off things that are dirty. <coughs> you can kind of lighten it to clearing out your closet, you know, with all old clothes maybe. Old styles have gone out of fashion. We need to get rid of them. There's a lot of old styles still out there that we need to be got rid of. But old styles. And, and, and what Peter is saying here, becoming a Christian means taking off all our muddy and dirty clothing. Changing some of our spiritual wardrobes. It, it's a spiritual thing he wants us to do. And these five attitudes... What he's saying is, if you're born again of the Spirit, if you're now a Christian, these five attitudes should no longer be part of your spiritual wardrobe. We need to get rid of them. So here we go. Let's look at some. Number one, malice. Put away all malice. Well, the word malice refers to evil actions that characterize the things that we do when we're in the world. It's a general term for evil in all its various forms. Malice is a desire, and it can be a number of things, but it's a desire to maybe hurt somebody with words or deeds. It can be a resentment that causes you to lash out at somebody. And while we see that in the world, God doesn't expect to see it in the church. He doesn't expect it. That's the first thing Paul is saying, it's got to be put off. There's no malice in the church. Deceit. This is something else that has no place in the church. Deceitful Attitudes are when you tell a lie or even omit to tell the truth. People think, well, I, I'm, I'm just not going to tell the truth. That'll be okay. Well, if you omit to tell the truth, it comes under this category of deceiving somebody. And often people omit the truth in order to gain maybe a personal advantage over somebody. I believe deceit is a clever form of deliberate dishonesty. It's what you do when you play a trick on someone in order to get your own way. And you know what? You can see these kind of attitudes in kids when they're growing up. It's in their DNA, if you like. And it's in their DNA because we're all born in sin. You don't, you don't have to tell a child to be naughty, to be bad, to be, you know. You don't have to tell them. They kind of know how to go there and get there. But what happens is, as you grow up, you learn the opposite of the, the bad things that are inherent in you and I as we're growing up. 
And so you learn the good things. So th there's no room for malice. There's no room for deceit. A third thing that Peter mentions is hypocrisy. And again, this word comes from the Greek theater and refers to the practice of putting on a mask and playing a part on stage. I talked about this a little bit last week when I mentioned that love has to be sincere. I talked about it being the opposite of being phony, fake or hypocritical. And that you can put a mask on and you can, you know, see that coming into effect when you meet somebody you didn't expect to meet. They kind of turn away and come back and they've come back with a mask on the face. Well, this is what this is talking about here with this word hypocrisy. It's, it's pretending to be something or someone that you're not. And so you put this mask on. Again, one of the main complaints about people not coming to church is, guess what? Hypocrisy. Why people won't come? They think Christians are hypocritical. And that because of that, they, they stay away from anything to do with the church and Christianity. And so Peter now is asking us to get rid of this, to put it away. Because when we have the absence of these things, and people come into contact with you and I, I believe they'll see somebody different than what they expect the church to be. The fourth word that Peter gives us is envy. Envy. Someone once wrote, saying about envy, it's the last sin that Christians will confess because it's so ugly. Envy. Envy is jealousy at the success of others. Or it delights in another's misfortune. I believe it's the poison of the soul that turns somebody into being resentful, angry, grouchy, miserable, or critical. Envy is, has, has, has no place in a Christian's life. Amen. You know, there's, there's all kinds of people out there blessed by all kinds of means. And you and I have got to look at them and say, God bless you. I think God's blessed you for a reason. But there's so much envy that goes on. We're not to have that in the Christian household. The fifth word, slander. Here's a word I've experienced against me many times in the Christian church. Many times. It's horrible. This is one of the words that I hate out of all of these more than the others I hate. It's the, the word that comes from the, the Greek translation which literally means to speak down to somebody and it includes gossip, tale telling, backbiting, spreading rumors, passing along bad information, taking cheap shots at people, using humor to belittle someone and unkind words. Slander needs to be absent and put away from the church. You can slander someone with a raised eyebrow, with an unfinished sentence, twisting the truth to make someone look bad, judging others unfairly, putting someone down in order to make yourself look good. Slander is usually the fruit of envy. When you look at somebody and you're envious, then you begin to say things and slander somebody. It's wrong. It has no place in the Christian environment. And because slander is almost done in every situation behind the back of another person, it then becomes the action of hypocrisy. Turn to Proverbs 6 in your Bibles. 
I hope you've got this on the line. Verses 16 through to 19. You see some of these things in this list here. And by the way, these five things are not exhaustive. There's lots and lots of other actions that people exhibit in the Christian church that can be added to these things. Right now, this is what Peter wants to concentrate on because they kind of cover a lot of the others in and of themselves. Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19 says, says this. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And, and, and he's used that word hate. It's good to use the word hate when it's appropriate. And we should use hate when it's connected with sin. Here they go. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. Slander. And one who sows discord among the brothers. Disunity. A lot of these things here are right now in the church. And I, I just feel these words that Peter is saying today are so relevant for now. It's one thing for them to be out there. You can expect that. But they're not to be in the church. And Peter is asking you and I to look at them. And if there's any evidence of these five rotten attitudes in our life, they've got no place, he's saying. Not in your life or even in the church. There's no place for them in the Christian wardrobe. And it's up to you and I if we see, if we hear, or witness any of these things going on in this church, you and I have the right to put a stop to them. It's the word of God. You know, if, if, if we're talking about the, these actions this morning, we're saying they're wrong, and then we witness that happening in and amongst us and we do nothing about it, we're just as bad. We're just as bad. We have to see it and put a stop to it. And so as we've looked at these, these are all the relational sins with people around us. The horizontal sins of how we relate to difficult people. That you and I rub shoulders with each week in this community we call Freedom Christian Church. So the question comes for you and I, what is our horizontal attitude and life like this morning? Is it according to the Bible or is it according to these areas that Peter's point, pointing out? So let's now look at verse 2 and see how God wants us to counteract those bad attitudes. And he gives us what we need to fight and overcome. And here it is in verse 2. It's a vertical attitude that he wants us to take on board. And it says this, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So what he's saying is you're saved. You're saved by being born again. And what he wants you to do now is counteract those Things that you did before you became a Christian that you bring in to the church. Guys, just because you give your life to Jesus doesn't mean to say you're perfect. Because when you give your life to Jesus and you walk through the door of a church, you've still got those things inherent in you that you did before you became a Christian. Amen. And so what Peter now is giving his instruction is, is to do something about those things now that you have become a Christian. And he's saying now the, the, the remedy for this is to get in the Word of God. 
And he, and he likens this to, to milk. The milk of God's word. Like, like a baby would crave its mother's milk. You know, babies have a unique and unmistakable way of letting you know when they're hungry. <laughs> the baby gets fussy, begins to cry. And the only thing to do to stop that is what? Feed it. Feed it. Milk for a baby is not a fringe benefit. It's necessary. It's necessary for a baby's life. And so as we use this image, as Peter uses it, it doesn't mean to say that all its readers were brand new Christians or baby Christians. People think this is a reference to baby Christians. It, it's not necessarily. It's a reference to Christians who've not shed the issues of life, the things of life that are still causing problems in the church. Because I know many Christians, 20, 30 years old, who still have these traits, who still behave like this in a church. And so for those Older Christians, if you like, this applies to them. It applies to everybody. What Peter means is that we are all to be hungry for God's word, just like a baby is for its mother's milk. The reason's clear. So that by it, you may grow up in your salvation. Do you hear that? You may grow up in your salvation. You're saved. Now God says, grow up. Grow up. Have you said that to your kids? Oh, just grow up. <laughs> just grow up. I bet, I bet God is sick of saying grow up. The way Christians behave. But God is saying to you and I this morning, please grow up. And there's a remedy. Like for a baby, it's milk to grow up. For you and I, it's the word of God. We can't grow up without the Word of God. There's an important word that Peter uses that I believe is key to growing up. And it's the word crave. You ever crave for something? Have you ever craved, as ladies, as you walk past the shop with a cream cake in the window? Have you ever craved for that? Men don't crave for cream cake. Or chocolate, bacon, yeah, you're right, bacon. <laughs> but it's that desire. We, we can do that. We can crave for things in life. You know, we can crave for all kinds of things. And, and, and some, a lot of those things are okay. They're good things. But Peter said, crave for the Word of God. Crave for it. It's a desire that leads, I believe, to vigorous action. To do something. It's to yearn for something. To the point that it becomes consuming. You know when a baby starts to feel hungry. It starts to be consumed. With the only thing that will satisfy that desire. And that's milk in its mouth. Are we like that with the word of God? Is that what we're consumed with? Or are we consumed with other things in life? Is that a desire of our hearts? So that until we read and learn, we will never be satisfied. Well, let me tell you something. You might not think that it's possible. You might think it's a bit far-fetched. But if you and I lived in a communist country, we'd soon crave for the word of God. They're craving for God's word today. They're craving for somebody to take Bibles to them. And if we lived in those countries, you and I would give anything to have the living, breathing, transforming word of God in our hands. You know, when I became a Christian at 30 years old, after 30 years of not reading the Bible, I picked this, this book up for the first time in this way, to learn. I couldn't get enough of it. I, I'm still a baby today in the Word of God, craving the Word of God. That's what this Word is all, all about. You might say, well, it's all right for you, you have to do it. You know, that's, that, you're the pastor. No, I'd do it if I wasn't a pastor. When I became a Christian, I wasn't a pastor. 
I wasn't even involved in a church. But I couldn't get enough of it. Three and a half years did a correspondence course. I still couldn't get enough of it. You know, it's God's word to you and I in this day that we have to see that if we take this out of the equation, we're taking God's voice to us out of the equation. And so when I know that Peter is trying to get you and I to go from this way of life to this way of life, we have to be the ones that make the choice. And this is Peter's point in these two verses. The way we treat one another, which are those horizontal attitudes that we talked about, has a direct impact on our relations with God, which is our vertical attitude. Attitude. If, if we're running and behaving and living in those attitudes that we talked about, we can't have a relationship with God. You know the reason why? Sin. God, God doesn't want a relationship with anything to do with sin. That's why some people, when, when they pray, if there's sin in their life, there's a barrier. There's a barrier to God. We have to put it off. We have to make the choice. Because when your horizontal is messed up, your vertical will never be right. God has wired us up so that the horizontal and the vertical go together. Let me tell you a verse in 1 John chapter 4. Verse 20. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he's not seen. Again, these are the words of John. Just common sense words. You know, when we're malicious, deceitful, hypocritical, envious, or slanderous, it's like poison in the soul that chokes off our desire for the Word of God. If you're not living in the right way, if you're not behaving in the right way, the Word of God becomes something of a secondary importance. When your horizontal is out of whack, your vertical is out of whack. And you know the reason Peter told us to rid ourselves in verse 1 is because in verse 3 he's saying now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, now that you have a, 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 an initial relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't behave like this if at all you have got a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that begs the question, if people still behave with these attitudes, it begs the question whether they really do know Jesus Christ. Amen. It really does. And that's why we should not be involved in any sinful, horizontal behavior. It all comes back to our relationship with the Lord. It's about Him. It's about loving one another and growing spiritually. All about Jesus Christ. When we act sinfully in the ways we've talked about, I believe we've forgotten the goodness of the Lord. And that word earlier on, those two words, grow up, are so important. You know, we grow up as kids, and like you say, you start with certain behavior, and you begin to learn along the way. And you change very gradually into your teenage years which again is a whole different mindset and you have to you know, visit that on many occasions to change that mindset and then into your adult years. And growing up gradually is the process that every person should take. Unfortunately, there's some adults that want to stay in childhood mode. Those childhood modes that know when you do a certain thing, you get a certain way. Have you ever seen a kid in a supermarket stamping his feet and, and screaming and wailing? 
and, and the mother or the father says, yeah, ha have this. And, you know, they give it something to shut them up. I just feel like saying, you need to teach them why they shouldn't be screaming. Don't just feed the screaming. That's what they do, they're feeding the screaming. And unfortunately, some adults have got away with it into, into teenage years, into adulthood. And when they're adults, they stamp the feet when they can't get the wrong way. And that's what takes place. Even coming into faith in Jesus Christ, there's some habits that need to be left behind. And put them off. And grow up. And become what God wants you to become. That's a strong believer in Jesus Christ. Psalm 34, 8 says this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I believe if people have a real taste of the Lord, they won't behave in those ways. The Lord tastes better than sin. Because if you do get into sin after you've tasted that the Lord is good, sin becomes vile. Some be sin becomes obvious. They say revenge is sweet, but I believe the Lord is sweeter. Amen. Sin brings pleasure for a moment, but with the Lord there is eternal joy. What this word is saying in verse 3 this morning is, you got a taste of God's goodness when you came to Jesus. Don't forget that goodness. Don't forget that taste at the moment of salvation. I, I believe God would say to us this morning, do you remember what that felt like when you gave your life to Jesus? Do you remember how wonderful it felt to have the load of sin lifted off his shoulders? Do you know what it felt like to be free? I, I've often described when I came to know Jesus, it was like a ball and chain being taken off my ankle. I felt free for the first time. I think some of us have forgotten what it was like, where we came from, what pit we came from, and what we were rescued from, how dirty we were. And when that happens, it's easy to become critical and judgmental of others. I believe that bitterness will kill our appetite for his sweetness. Let's get rid of all the bitterness. And instead of tasting the Lord, we're now eating spiritual junk food. We're filling our minds with, with different things and our hearts become hardened. Things that are harmful to us. And you can do that by many, many ways. You can do that by reading the wrong books or magazines or going on the internet or watching movies and TV. There's all different ways that we can get into here that affects what comes out of here. And Peter's saying, let the word of God get into here so that affects what comes out of here and our attitudes towards one another. We need to get back to feeding on Jesus and his word. We need to be asking and praying that God would make us hungry for his word and for his understanding of who he is. The horizontal is the key to the vertical and the vertical is the key to the horizontal. I've not got these down on the screen this morning as, as a, a Bible verse for you to look at. I, I kind of remembered these as just before I came out this morning uh, about the importance of this vertical and horizontal relationship that, that the Lord wants us to adopt this morning. And it comes from Matthew 22, verses 37 and onwards. You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments 
depend all the law and the prophets. My Bible, this is in red. These are the words of Jesus. And when Jesus said it, says it, we better believe it. Amen. To love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. The vertical with the horizontal. I remember preaching a message many years ago. I entitled it, Life with a capital L. God and our neighbor. That's what Jesus wants. It's all about God. It's all about a living love that's demonstrated in our relationships. And all because we're growing as Christians as we feed on his word. I'm going to finish with one more scripture. Again, I found this. It's not on the overhead. In John 13, verse 35. And he says this. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Can you remember what it says? By this. If you have love for one another. By this, not by the fact that you're Baptist or you're a Methodist or anything else or that you're a man or a woman or that you've been in a church for 30 years or anything else. By this, if you have love for one another. Amen. This is God's word to you and I today. Let's believe it. Let's make sure we apply it. And if there's any areas that we've talked about that we see or know, then let's do something about it. Because God would say this morning, a living love needs to be seen by everybody around us. Amen. Let's pray, shall we?